Welcome to the Living With series. My name is Claire Wilds Wright, and on behalf of the Hypersomnia Foundation, I'm excited today to introduce you to a new author called Quinn Eastman. He is about to publish a book called The Woman Who Couldn't Wake Up, Hypersomnia and the Science of Sleepiness. I'm particularly excited to welcome Quinn today because it's one of the first books that specifically talks about idiopathic hypersomnia and the Hypersomnia Foundation. A little bit about Quinn then, he is a science writer and an editor at Emory University School of Medicine and has been since 2007. He was trained as a biochemist, receiving a PhD from Yale University and then worked in Munich, Germany as a postdoctoral researcher. Later, Quinn was a newspaper reporter in the San Diego area covering local government and environmental issues. And today he lives in Georgia with his family. One of the things I loved about reading his new book was that it weaves personal stories of patients in our community, the history of the Hypersomnia Foundation, and indeed the history of idiopathic hypersomnia itself with flourishes of scientific data and research that is so well weaved into the larger narrative. The book is about to be published and will be available on Amazon. And today I'd love to dig into some of the thinking around the book, um, how it was born, how Quinn wrote it, and why it's relevant to our community today. So without further ado, let's jump into our conversation with Quinn. Quinn. Eastman, it is really good to spend some time with you. Um, I've been looking forward to this interview for some time, having uh, known you for a few years uh, in the sleep space and uh, anticipating the release of, I think it's your first book, is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, congratulations. Never did this before. I know it's a huge, yeah, no, oh really? Well, it's a huge achievement. And uh, having read the manuscript in the last couple of weeks, I did want to say congratulations on the um, forthcoming publication of your book. And I'm absolutely delighted to share the content and your experience as a writer and why our community need to go and buy this book on its release, which I think is June, right? <laughs> is it, or is that a difficult question? Um, Maybe. That's, what they're, <laughs> that's what they're promising me. But it, okay. they, they move things up by like a week. <laughs> Okay. Well, let's let's just start with with the title and a brief outline, Quinn, on on the book itself. Well, uh, the woman who couldn't wake up is a reference to Anna, uh, Anna Sumner, who's kind of the starting point for all this, at least um, both in the story and then also for me. Um, and um, you know, it's. The title is trying to make to be sort of like a reference to Oliver Sacks books. And there's also um, like in the 80s or the 90s, there was a book by uh, Judith Rappaport, who's um, kind of put uh, obsessive compulsive disorder on the map. And that that was called The Boy Who Couldn't Stop Washing. So it's <laughs> the titles are trying to be kind of, you know, in the same uh, vein. So how did the book actually come about from the sort of birth of the idea to, um, yeah, to the writing process and almost now to publication? Where did it all start? Well, it started really with um, Anna and Kathy Parker. Um, when, so um, for a lot of the last 15 years, uh, I, I've been a science writer at Emory University in Atlanta. And when I started working there, um, there was um, already this story that somebody else wrote. <laughs> um, and it was based on a lecture given by Kathy Parker, who was a nursing professor who was involved in taking care of Anna. Um, so she gives this lecture uh, saying um, there's Anna, she's an attorney at a big law firm in Atlanta, and she's having just this, she, her life is being taken over by sleep. Um, she sleeps for 12 hours a day. She's always thinking about it. Um, they, her doctors gave her uh, kind of conventional treatments at the time, modafinil and then other stimulants, and they 
kind of backfire in this spectacular way and that she starts to have crashes and sleeps for more than 24 hours at a time. Mm-hmm. Um, so she's at this point where, you know, should, should I quit? Maybe I should quit my job, but, you know, I'm, what's happening? And um, so they, Parker is working with this uh, neurologist at, uh, at Emory named David Rye, who you have met and got to know and is uh, plays an important part in putting together the hypersomnia foundation later. (laughs) Um, So they come up with this idea to treat um, Anna with this oddball drug called flamazenil, um, which is usually seen as an antidote for uh, benzodiazepines. And, um, you know, spoiler alert, it, it works really well where nothing, nothing else <laughs> had worked before. Um, she says, you know, I feel awake like I haven't felt in years. And, um, and this allows her to get her life back and go back to work and get married and all the, all the things she wanted to do. Um, the, the trick was, is that. Um, flamazenil is not available in the way that she, that would have been so that she could take it. So they, she had to do all this wrangling with, uh, Roche, the manufacturer to get a consistent supply. And then also, um, kind of all the regulatory bodies in order to make, make sure that it can happen. Um, so this is sort of this this story that was around, uh, at, at, and and at the point when when Kathy Parker started talking about it, she hadn't even, I don't think they had even worked out the whole all the details with Roche yet. She was still kind of in the process of asking them help. <laughs> um, so there, there's this transition that takes place where you know it's not just Anna. There are the the question ha- was. Are there other people like her who have these symptoms, who respond to this medication? You know, at the when when Kathy Parker is giving her lecture, um, they me- make a reference to idiopathic hypersomnia, which is her diagnosis. Uh, in a, if, when we look into it, she gets diagnosed by going through an MSLT. Uh, multiple sleep latency test, which you know most people who are diagnosed with either narcolepsy or IH go through this test, um, and then it's the results are very clear. She has IH, um, but Kathy Parker kind of says, "Well, we only use this because um, you know we didn't know re- what the issue really was, and that that explain that." Um, that kind of shows how IH is viewed by sort of this conventional um, uh, physician or other uh, met, uh, medical provider. And that is, you know, it's sort of, well, we can't figure you, you can't figure, we can't figure you out. So we're just going to put you in this category here. And I, you, we find out that, that there are a lot of people who um, have this vague label <laughs> applied to them. And, and it means that they have all kinds of trouble getting insurance coverage for their medication. Mm-hmm. You have, even to have doctors take them seriously. Um, you know, it, it it's kind of puts them in this kind of in-between space of like, we know that you have something, but we just don't know Mm. what it is (laughs) you um as a as a science writer though quinn how did you sort of have access to the sleep space and perhaps perhaps what i'm getting at here is can you tell us a little bit about your own experience with sleep disorders oh (laughs) yeah um so around the time that i you know i eventually met anna and and you know got to know her, but around the, but around that time, I, I myself was diagnosed with sleep apnea, um, so which is much more common than um, either narcolepsy or IH, and um, so I 
cer certainly have experienced some of the same symptoms that people, but <laughs> the explanation is very, is much more straightforward. Um, if like, if I go to a lecture <laughs> at, you know, and it's, you know, not, you know, super exciting that I would be in danger of falling Fall asleep. asleep. Um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, and that can be embarrassing. Right. Um, and I don't know if I've really had any car accidents because I fell asleep in the car, but, um, you know, I can certainly, I'm aware of the, da the danger of it. Right. <laughs> so, right. um, I can right. certainly empathize with the people who, who went through this. Right. And then when, when you hear the stories of people with IH that, you know, that this is, this is something that is sort of their entire day is some is where they're, they're feeling like there's this fog mm -hmm. that they can't see past. Mm -hmm. Um, then I, mm -hmm. I can, yeah. I mean, I tell people that, mm -hmm. that, you know, if I go to a support group meeting or something like that, then, then I'll, I'll say, well, you know, I, I have seen what you have seen, but only experienced, but through a keyhole. Like mm -hmm. I, like, right. um, right, I don't right. get the full, yeah. full experience. Yeah. But it must've intrigued you. I mean, I think, uh, I think you and I met actually, um, through a narcolepsy conference, but the book speaks about Anna. She's certainly the main character at the beginning, though by no means all the way through. And there's some other, um, protagonists that I'd love to talk about as well, but how, um, <laughs> How did you, yeah, how did you come into kind of contact and relationship with the Hypersomnia Foundation specifically? Because this, this one of the things I love about the book is how you manage to weave the personal story that totally comes alive through storytelling around Anna um, and similar um, people with IH, but also there's, it's part history, right? There's a, there's um, the history of the Hypersomnia Foundation. I'd love to talk about that a little bit. And then you also weave in this sort of extraordinary scientific journey of discovery with Dr. Rai and various other researchers like Dr. Trotty around Emory. But um, tell us a little bit about your relationship with the Hypersomnia Foundation and, and why you included that as such an integral theme <sighs> to the book. Well, it's partly because when, when you look at it, um, so with with Anna, there and and then other people, Rye was had this idea about what was behind her and other people's sleepiness, and that there was this mm -hmm. substance mm -hmm. in their cerebrospinal fluid, um, which uh, you know acts in the same way as a benzodiazepine, and that explain that would explain why flumazenil woke them up. And um, the that that was sort of the missing piece of the puzzle for a long time, and it's this is a puzzle that has never been resolved. Um, and so, so he has this anecdotal kind of small scale success, you know, one person's success and success for some other people. You know, other people try flumazenil eventually, <laughs> uh, and it it works for them. And, you know, he wants to, you know, bring this tool and make it available to more people. Um, and mm -hmm. he never really gets there. Um, he wants to show that what is the biology behind it. And he doesn't get there. Um, so in terms of, you know, Rai is kind of like the hero of the book, part, at least part for part of the story, but he doesn't get what he wants. What comes out of, his efforts is that the Hypersomnia Foundation is put is is formed, and 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 I would say that the the result of what he was trying to do gets kind of taken up by other people, and they say, well, the what we need to do is get together as a community. We all have these issues. We have this mm -hmm. sleep disorder diagnosis. There's nothing, addre nobody addresses what, what we have gone through. Um, there's no FDA approved medication. There's no, like there are insurance companies treat us like there were frauds. You know, the, <laughs> how, do, how do we get 
get past that, the the impact of Anna is that it's this you know, the anecdotal sto- story. It's kind of like a detective story that is never solved. Mm. It's a crime solved. that is never mm-hmm. solved. Yeah, and Dr. Rye, I think it's probably worth mentioning that Dr. David Rye is still at Emory for... The- yeah, for the the sake of our audience, Dr. David Rye has been a key researcher in um, idiopathic hypersomnia and and other areas of sleep medicine. But he's very much the protagonist, isn't he? Certainly, uh, the first half of the book. How, um, yeah, how much do you think the community that was um, harnessed around the formation of the Hypersomnia Foundation has sort of accelerated awareness for IH and really impacted the community? Um, it's, it's hard to say. Um, uh, totally, I think in the United States, there's definitely been a, in an effect. Like people who um, get are newly diagnosed with IH, they have somewhere to go. You know, there's a plate, mm-hmm. there's, there's online, there's something that comes up. <laughs> it's not just a Wikipedia page, <laughs> um, which, you know, there are people who are connected with the Hypersomnia Foundation who had something to do with that too. Um, so there's, there's more, there's, there are support groups that they, you know, I mean, they're not one in every, town but you know there's something available for them um and then as far as what what i don't know fully is that you know i um there's a there's a company that never that that conducts the first clinical trials for that include people with ih and that's balanced therapeutics and i know that they their their heads were turned by 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 Rye and also the the Hypersomnia Foundation um, because I talked with them, <laughs> but as far as other companies, um, I didn't get as much into a dialogue mm-hmm. with them. So mm-hmm. um, I don't know the story from you know Jazz, for example, who which. Is the company that eventually had its product get an F- FDA approval? Um, I don't know when they first started thinking about IH. I know that someone who worked for Jazz went to the first living with hypersomnia meeting um, before there even really was a hypersomnia foundation. Um, but I don't know who said what and whether they said. Uh, once we get this, whether they were really interested in it or it was sort of, well, since we're developing this new product, why don't we just throw them in there too? I don't, I don't know. Um, but clearly other companies, I talked with some other companies, I didn't get all of the them to <laughs> put their thoughts on record. Um, mm. But I think that that mm. has ex- I mean, that, the fact that there are now a bunch of clinical trials that, you know, from Takeda, mm-hmm. Harmony, that mm-hmm. include people with IH, um, that shows kind of this, the cent- one of the central thoughts of the book, which is um, if, we, if we build it, if we build this organization, then we can be a partner with other people out there whether that's industry, whether that's Mm -hmm. academic researchers. Um. Yeah, I think that that speaks to that that um, phrase, if you build it, they will come. But um, you, yeah, you saw, you've you've seen the Hypersomnia Foundation from its birth and you, you really do a great job of that storytelling. Um, And it's really inspiring actually, Quinn, because it always starts with 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 someone's commitment doesn't it and an idea and people rallying around and i think you do a great job of communicating that who are the main uh players that you i mean i sort of know the answer to this but um yeah who who are the main players in in the hypersomnia foundation that really uh, lifted the organization because it's 10 years old now um 
And it's a very different looking organisation in a very different space, actually. As you said, there's a lot more engagement with industry and other advocacy groups and um, it's got a global presence, but it, it wasn't always the case, was it? So um, tell us a little bit about the people that you you felt we, you know, we should honour in, in terms of the work that they did right at the beginning of the organisation. Certainly, Diana Kimmel has been a great resource for me and a great uh in terms of opening doors and providing insights. Mm -hmm. um, it was actually Jennifer Beard, someone close to her, who was the first, uh, was kind of one of the founding board members. In the book, she sort of represents the experience of someone with IH who was diagnosed and then was like, right. what's going on? There's nothing, right. you know, there's, there's not any really support or resources available for me. Um, but also, mm -hmm. um, Michelle Emmerich, who's a board member. Um, I don't. I mean, I don't know everybody's story, but those are the, the those are two people who kind of stick out right. for me as being important as, as in right. those early days. Yeah, yeah. I think it's really amazing when you know you've got people who um, you know diagnosed with a condition as challenging as IH, but somewhere have those resources deep within them to actually do something really positive to the community. So um, I have the pleasure actually of working with both Michelle and, and Diana now. So um, it was great to actually see those names in print. Um, so we've talked about protagonists. If, if, I mean, I mean, there are other, if I just the, want to leave people out. But. Yes. <laughs> Right, right. Don't want to be a spoiler alert, but who, who, or what are the antagonists in the book? Well, I want to point out that um, the chapter one sets up um, David Rye and Eve Dovier as being kind of scientific rivals. Um, you know that he, mm -hmm. uh, Dovier has this track record of shooting down other people's theories, um, but they are not really opponents in the sense that, um, you know, Rye and Dovier agree that there should be more attention to idiopathic hypersomnia, right. more research, you know, they, they have the same goals as far as that goes. Um, so the antagonists are kind of two, twofold. One is just the mystery of the science. The science doesn't work out in a lot of cases. Um, it's sort of the can't make all the clues line up. And then the other thing is, and this is harder, the that um, the sleep medicine field is oriented around um, sleep apnea and narcolepsy, and you know, yeah, patients who go, you know, start are seen by a sleep specialist are seen through this lens, and. Um, those are the kind of the structure, the institutional structures that have been built up to serve those that com that community, mm -hmm. and th the orientation is for those conditions. And if you don't have, don't right. really ha have something that fits that, right? Then, um, that's kind of that's kind of the 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 getting the field to shift and say, okay, there are people. There are other people whose needs are not met. That's really the the what what the people in the book are working against. Right. And your book it is the first book, right, on specifically this type of storytelling on idiopathic hypersomnia. Is that correct? That I know of. <laughs> right. I mean, and the, I think that's so there interesting are other, because there are other books, <laughs> but <laughs> Yes, on sleep, many, many, um, and yeah, yeah. I'm right in, yeah, but I'm right in saying that it's Columbia Press that are publishing it um, early summer. Where where can people find the book, Quinn? Once it's released, or how can they find out when it? What when's the release date, and where can they buy it? <laughs> um, I, my understanding is um, in June. There will be copies in the warehouse and then it will be available on Amazon. Um, I'm going to be at the uh, Hypersomnia Foundation Conference in Indianapolis and awesome. I'll Great. see if I yes. can get some copies there. Um, 
you know, whether my local bookshop, <laughs> Little Shop of Stories in Decatur, Georgia, will will have any copies. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if they're going to do that, but um, um, yeah, it'll it's it's going to be available the way you know lots of people get their books. Right, we'll definitely be able to help help with that. I think nearer the time, um, and you're going to speak about your book at the um, Beyond CP conference in Indianapolis in June. So, um, if anyone wants to come and hear Quinn learn more about the book and pick up an advanced copy, that would be the place. And we can post registrations um, in the copy um, at the end of this interview. But um, so, quick question: How long did it take you to write the book? You said, I saw something about you started, um, it was an idea in 2017, which is interesting because that's actually when I published mine, but my, mine took about two years to write and a year to edit. But yeah, what was the writing journey like for you? I mean, you're already a writer, um, but this was obviously your first independent publication. Right. Um, so I, I got the idea to, okay, I should write a book about this in 2017, but I have been following kind of Anna's story Right, like I went to the, mm. first, you know, the first living with hypersomnia conference, and then some other ones since then. Um, before twenty seventeen, uh, but that was always kind of just like, you know, I'm interested, but I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> um, and so twenty seventeen, I had to make the de decision. Okay, they're having this thing in the the World Sleep Conference in Prague. And then that would be a chance. And then actually, I want to give credit to somebody, uh, Michelle Chadwick, um, who uh, is the founder of Hypersomnol Hypersomnolence Australia. And she was the, she recorded an interview with, I think, Sonia Nevshimalova and um, Jan Roth, who's the son of Bedrich Roth, who's kind of the person who originally identified idiopathic hypersomnia in Cold War era Czechoslovakia. And so I think she had recorded in an interview with both of them for some other thing, some other t uh, occasion. Um, but that's how I knew that it would be good to go to Prague where... Mm. Mm. All of this stuff is going to be hash. Uh, a lot of this stuff is going to be hashed out, you know. Um, and then I end up ended up meeting a lot of interesting people. Um, and then that that is when I kind of made made the decision. Oh, I'm going to jump in with both feet. Then had to like get an agent, write an <laughs> write an application for a no, grant, I, yeah. and then just okay. um, yeah, you know, um, yeah. and then really figure out what the like the story was not finished, you know. Um, I was I kept hoping that the the researchers at Emory, Rye, Andy Jenkins, that they would kind of come to a point where they can say, okay, we found what this mysterious stuff is, and um, and they, mm. you know, there's still some there's still not some yet. work going on yeah. there, but but they haven't really come to the point of being able to say we found it. Um, Right. And instead, there's this other development comes kind of comes out of left field. Um, uh, you know, jazz gets approval for its drug, um, and then the, the 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 thing is, the story becomes less about kind of a a detective story, like we're in the lab and we're looking for something that's mysterious, and it's more about the people getting mm -hmm. together and saying, our needs are not met. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's do this that so that other people could benefit from it. Mm. Yeah. I think that's quite, quite difficult to pull off. Yeah. They're figuring that out. Uh, it, it took a little while. <laughs> right. And it's interesting because you sort of want a resolution, but I think the truth and the storytelling really plays out well in, in your narrative. But what what were the what were the challenges as a writer that you faced with this this really significant project? Partly just organizing the material kind of in and just doing the work. Um, mm -hmm. It was um, getting people to talk to me um, mm -hmm. and some people 
didn't want to, um, and, and, and that's okay. Some people want to tell their own story. Um, or they you know, just want to be private for whatever re other reason. Um, and just like, I learned how to do a lot of things like, you know, file FOIA requests, um, you know, go to archives in, in strange countries, uh, you know, just, um, mm. that was great. Uh, but just, uh, just figuring out what to put in and what to leave out. Yeah, no, I think absolutely. You're, I mean, the narrative is fully coherent, Quinn. It's, I think what you're saying, there wasn't a neat ending, but um, necessarily because it's still an ongoing yeah. topic that has so many challenges and is still in evolution. And I think, you know, your contribution to uh, raising awareness and educating the world about idiopathic hypersomnia is really significant. So kudos to you for actually doing the work if if someone's listening to this and they thought they you know they think they've got a book in them or want to tell their story in some capacity what advice would you give them well um number one is to like save stuff like keep old photos and old um and organ and and uh medical records or i mean especially if you're going to write about kind of your own story is to just mm -hmm. save that stuff. Well, I mean, a lot of people do have to save that stuff. And as far as like whether someone should start a blog or um, I'm not sure about that. Um, mm -hmm. I wonder whether that sort of had its day a little bit actually. But just the other thing is to talk to to talk to lots of people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, nowadays, I mean, if, if you want to be a social media influencer and get your story out that way, you, I mean, that's might be the, the 21st century way mm -hmm. of doing things rather than to it's write a book. It's a form of storytelling, definitely. Yeah, I think both, actually. I think both um, are really valuable contributions, but they're very, very different mediums. Yeah, the people like, you know, Julie Flygar, uh, you know, she... She has the the what is it rising voices uh, mm -hmm. uh, advocacy series program, correct? Where all these yeah. people, I mean, they're going to go out to medical schools and to nursing mm -hmm. schools and, and and tell their stories, um, and that that is that is great That's, because then yes. you know someone will have an example in in their minds, like a a nurse, a doctor who doesn't know any doesn't know somebody with a sleep disorder. They will have someone you know an idea mm -hmm. in their mind. Oh. Real people experience this. It's not right. just you know, an, yeah. you know a weird thing that happens in a, in a textbook. Yeah. But so that that's kind of like the new way of doing it, right? Right, it is, and it's really, really effective. And I should say that oh. although it's called the Rising Voices and Narcolepsy Program through Project Sleep, which, as you mentioned, is run by Julie Flygate, it's also open for people with idiopathic hypersomnia. So um, that's that's a great that's great advice, Quinn for sure. So yeah, not to be intimidated by writing a whole book, but there's certainly many, many ways to raise awareness and education. So Quinn, what can people get out of reading your book? There's a central idea in the book and that it's expressed by um, uh, Diana Kimmel and Jennifer Beard uh, that is, is sort of, let's do what people with other diseases do. Um, and um, so the message to people with IH is to get together with others and compare notes and that there is value in your struggle as dismal as it may seem from the inside. Um, you know, mm -hmm. now there are some medications available that might help. Others are coming. Um, there's a role for IHers in helping to shape clinical trials. And I think the field is really paying attention where 10 years ago it was not. Right. I wonder how much of that speaks to the sort of rise of the patient voice, um, you know, gaining more traction and more uh, just p patients are being heard more in in the right places, not not just chattering amongst themselves on you know digital media, but actually at conferences amongst researchers and clinicians, um, uh, primary healthcare providers. So I think you're right. <clears throat> this is a call to action isn't it that excuse me was thankfully started by pioneers like diana kimmel and jen and others um who have kind of got us to where we are right now but 
you know, sometimes what gets you here doesn't get you to the next step. So what are the next steps for the community, Quim? Um, I think th there could there could be a little bit more international outreach because I think the Hypersomnia Foundation is very um, US focused. And then there's probably, and there's, there's a whole side of things that I haven't, that I feel like I don't know enough about what, what, what kind of difficulties people in France and Germany and Italy and Japan, what, what, what issues do they have? Um, and then the other one is to keep focused on these kind of, uh, pocket bush book issues that, you know, just there's, um, now there's an FDA approved medication. There might be one in the future, but just keep educating these insurance companies so that they, mm. you know, realize that IH exists. Right. It's a little bit, it's a legitimate thing. <laughs> um, it's real. And then looking ahead, the the field thinks that wants to kind of redraw the boundaries of who gets diagnosed with what um and then i think people with i both narcolepsy and ih should have something to say about that well i'm super excited for you i wanted to say congratulations and i cannot wait to actually hold the book in my hands having read it on my desktop um and we look forward to seeing you at beyond sleepy in indianapolis in june and for anyone who wants to meet you just register to um that conference on all our social media platforms at hypersomnia foundation um and also our website so thank you so so much for your time congratulations again this is a really significant historical and current contribution to the conversations and experiences for people struggling with ih thank you quim 